Okay, so tonight uh, I'm going to answer a question on love. So the question uh, was something like, how do we how do we love without attachment? <clears throat> and uh, it's a difficult topic because it deals with some very complex mind states or complex processes and some parts of those processes are positive, some of them are negative and it gets quite mixed up and the reason, uh, an important reason why that is is because of how complex we are and, and it's important for us to if we're going to understand this and be able to investigate this topic without becoming upset by it, right? These these kind of videos are the ones that I often end up upsetting someone uh, with radical views of this sort or that sort. And this one's going to be probably pretty radical, so we have to slowly ease into it. <clears throat> and the reason why sometimes the Buddha's teaching seems quite radical, one reason, is because of how uh, conditioned we are and how artificial and specific our situation is as human beings. We exist as males and females, adults, children, relatives, uh, we have uh, reproductive organs, wombs that give, allow us to give birth. We have chemicals that produce uh, results and have <coughs> interactions with the brain and the brain with the mind and so on. And our very specific formulation as human beings. <coughs> Not to mention our very specific cultural values that were taught when we're young. And the movies we watch, the stories we tell, the stories we read, um, the examples we set for each other are very specific. And so, to some extent, it's important for us to compare the mind and these qualities like uh, love and attachment with the physical realm and we've seen s material scientists do this they're able to take apart things like this or, or like this and and tell you what it's actually composed of and so I was thinking about they have this periodic table of the elements and there's you don't you don't see anything about a human or nothing in there that's specifically relating to a brain or, a, or, or much less a society or a culture and so on. The physical world is made up of minute particles and, and in fact not so many of them, right? There's a finite number of, a fairly small number of particles that everything's made up of. And even if you go deeper, it's even fewer. Until you go so deep, you don't even know really what it is and it appears to be something very strange, but the mind uh, has a sort of periodic table as well, meaning there are finite and not a very large number of states, but they, again, they mix together and they come in, in amounts, right? A, a large amount, a small amount, and, and they mix with each other. It appears that there are an infinite number of personalities, right, or states. Um, but it's important to be able to, to make that distinction because 
our ideas of what we call love and, and, and our views on our relationships with others are, are very much contrived and often <clears throat> not based on any sort of good reason. I don't mean to say that it has to be logic or reason because, of course, I would say in many ways even Buddhism doesn't rely on logic or reason or intellect. So it's not to say that it's illogical to, to love or it's uh, irrational to love. That's not even a good excuse. But the idea that it's bad, it's harmful, or that it's positive and, and beneficial is, is important. And, and you can look at it that way. Just as you can look at the physical realm, not from a good or bad perspective, but from a perspective of the results, you know. When you mix certain chemicals together, they have certain results, certain consequences, explosions even. <clears throat> so, I would normally um, want to separate love out into positive love and negative love, but I don't even think that's going far enough. We have rather, in Buddhism, the word love is, is, is misleading. I mean, even in English, it's misleading, right? What does the word love mean? It's, it's very, not a very good word, because it's so vague. And I think there's a good point involved with that that I'll, I'll talk about as well. Why, or a good reason why it's so vague <coughs> that needs to be expressed. Um, but we have in Pali two words that I think sort of capture a lot of what we're talking about here, and they're metta. Metta, which is a fairly well-known Buddhist term, and Raga, which may not be so well-known. Now, Raga might not even be the best word, but it's one good word. It's not the only word to talk about the other side. Raga means, Raga means something like lust or passion or love in most of the ways that we mean it. I think it does mean love. But on the other side, we have this thing called Metta. And Metta is often translated as loving-kindness. And I think it, it used to be translated often as love. It's a kind of love, but then you have to explain what kind of love it is. It's altruistic in a sense. Or it's uh, unattached love or something. But loving kindness is sort of what people have settled on. And I don't even think that's fair. I don't think that's going far enough, as I said. I don't think that is an accurate definition of what metta actually is. I mean, just literally, the word metta means friendliness. Metta comes from the word mitta. When you take a word, mitta means friend. And when you take a word like friend and you want to say friendship, you just turn the I into an E, you strengthen it and it becomes metta. It's literally, grammatically, it's the word friend become friendship or friendliness. Friendship, maybe not. Friend, the state of being a friend or the quality of, of, of a friend. <coughs> Friendness is probably the most literal Friendliness, we would say, right? And so When we talk about Having love without Attachment I don't think That's possible Because I think it's uh, It's um, misunderstanding of, of where we're trying to get to or of what's actually positive. So I would often say, what is metta? What is the difference between metta and you know good love and bad love, for example? And you would say that good love is wishing for others to be happy. That's what we do when we practice metta. We say, may you be happy. May all beings be happy. But w simply wishing for someone to be happy is, is not necessarily a good thing, it's not necessarily wholesome because if you take um, from a Buddhist perspective, or it's not necessarily different from any other sort of attachment because if you look at a mother's love for their children they wish for their children to be happy a father as well, but they can often get quite angry and upset at their children when their children uh, or upset when their children are unhappy Right? when their children suffer, they suffer as well so it's clear that that's because they wish for their children to be happy, but it's still an attachment. So 
it's not to say that wishing for someone to be happy is wrong and you should never do it. I, you know, may you be happy. Oh, don't do that. You'll get attached to them. It's to say that there are, there are qualities um, of mind that are involved with friendliness that are positive, um, but that are quite different from any any kind of desire for an outcome and that's really the difference between um, th these two the, the the difference i mean you can see the difference even on a conceptual level if you talk about friends people who are friendly take a friendly store clerk for example sometimes you go into a store and the store clerk is uh, friendly because they feel like they have to and they're trying to be friendly sometimes it feels artificial but still it's pleasant and there's a pleasantness associated with their innocence or their innocuousness they're, 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 not, being, they're not being a threat to you they're not, they're, their state of not being out to get you uh, waiters, waitresses are often very pleasant to engage in and they don't, it's not because they love us they're not loving but they're friendly. And you see this quality in families. Um, you'll see that parents being friendly with their children, being in you know, happy with their happy towards their children, pleasant towards their children, children towards their parents, and so on. And we say, well, that's love, because we mix it. We mix it with all the other qualities. But it's not actually, it's just this quality that uh, people in the world also have. The um, the actual desire for even for someone else to be happy is often what, lead, what leads to great suffering. Um, <clears throat> the most obvious ones are when you have um, romantic in, in, in desire towards another person and they don't return that. This is you say a kind of love you want for them to make you happy. But it doesn't even have to be that way when, when, as I said, when you wish for someone else to be happy and they're not happy, you suffer greatly as well. When parents wish for their kids to be happy and so on. And so it, it, it all it doesn't escape the realm of, of the, the desire for some kind of an outcome. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't. It isn't categorically different from our desire for um, good food, or our desire for success, our desire for wealth, our desire for sensual pleasure. But on a molecular level, if we say the molecules of the mind, the the results are uh, the the sorry the characteristics are even more pronounced it's it's much easier to see the, sort of the difference and where uh like in a family or in in amongst friends or so on you would see the differences because the qualities of of love or any kind of attachment any kind of desire are pulling are the kind of things that disturb the mind Right. If if you are mindful and and friendly, say take a waiter or a waitress for example, they can be perfectly. Imagine you're an enlightened wait, waitress, waiter, a wait staff, server, barista. I often go to Starbucks for food, um, so and they're the nicest people. They must really. I don't know. There's something about that company. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I probably <laughs> Skip is laughing at me. Yeah, corporate uh, advertisement here. We should do it. I'm just kidding. Um, but they're the nicest people. They really are. It's a, it's really a and and clearly they've been trained at it, you know, or they've been selected for it or something, and they have this attitude of friendliness. Now imagine you have an enlightened barista. Someone who is uh, just so 
pure in their heart. Right? They, what I'm trying to say is you, you come in and you ask them for something and they do it. So they're disturbed. And so it looks like they've actually, because they want to help you, because they have a desire for you to be happy that they're, they're you know, bringing you what you need or so on. <clears throat> but they can do it very, very mindfully. So the difference comes when we get to those states, and there are states where you're no longer able to perform them mindfully, where they're no, no longer connected with states of clarity of mind and, and mindfulness. And this is where you really, really want for the other person to be happy. So when you say to yourself, may you be happy, when, when you say to, to, to in, in your mind, when you think, may that person be happy, may all beings be happy, or so on, <clears throat> you're expressing a um, perspective or, or an inclination, and it's an inclination of friendliness. It's a attitude. You're not actually saying, I want you to be happy. Boy, it matters to me whether you're happy. And and this is where we're starting to get, get into waters where people might be, be up un displeased by hearing this because you think, well, you should be caring, right? I've talked before about uh, not caring and how caring is actually where the problem starts. And you say, oh, that's very harsh and... This is this is displeasing for people to hear, but <clears throat> the problem, of course, with caring is that it's an unstable state. The state of friendliness is very composing, it's very powerful, it's very clear. In fact, in Buddhism, friendliness is, uh, is actually not considered to be a very, a, a separate mind state. The definition or the the um, characteristic of of friendliness is called adosa, which simply means the lack of anger. So when we practice metta, people actually will take time to cultivate metta um, as a meditation practice. And when when we do that, what we're actually doing is purifying our minds from anger. That's simply it. When you have no anger, your 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 default attitude is friendly. It's a it's a inclination, a way of relating to other beings in a pure way. It actually isn't this positive state of love or caring even. It's a very powerful so it, it's this is a, a state of mind that is just pure. It's kind of like uh, clear free of any kind of judgment or reaction. And and it's another sort of, I think, um, endorsement of the state of freedom from defilement as being one of naturally friendly. If you've ever been around people who are uh, advanced in their meditation practice, they tend to be quite friendly. And it might, it might even appear that they're very caring because they will go out of their way to help you because they're not bothered by it. But the state of actually caring, the state of actually being bothered, bothered and, and ha having your happiness depend on the happiness of others, or, or even worse, on the ability for others to, to make you happy, right? Because if if your happiness depends on others, you're still just saying you want them to make you happy. Right? I, I will be happy if you succeed in this way or that way. I will be happy if you're happy, that sort of thing. It's all about you again, right? It's actually, you could, you could argue it's quite selfish. When you care about someone's well-being, you're actually being quite selfish. You're saying, I won't be happy, or, or uh, it's not right unless this makes me happy. The... The reason why you should be happy is so that I'll be happy. I mean, it actually is that sort of way. I mean, that's the problem with it. It's a... No, I mean, the deeper problem is it's a disturbed state of mind. It's a state that is um, yearning, right? 
it's uh, unstable, it's weak. And more importantly, it's associated with um, negative mind states. And so this gets into, like I mentioned, the reason why we use the word love and why it's so vague and why the topic of love has so much mystery surrounding it, right? Love is blind. Why do fools fall in love, right? It's really a mysterious sort of mind state. And the reason, I think quite clearly, is because it's covered in darkness. Because love is a, love, or, or you know, it's go deeper um, attachment or clinging or desire. These are associated not with rational or let's not go to rational, but not with a clear mind or or a bright mind. But they're associated with ignorance and delusion. They're covered over in darkness. We don't know why we fall in love, and, and we think, well, that's very mysterious, and that's the mysterious nature of love. It's not, actually. We don't know because we're ignorant, because we're in darkness. If a person is very mindful, then they say, oh, yeah, that's why I'm falling in love. And they can actually uh, break it apart and, and are able to see it. Uh, I think more, more, more uh, accurately, when a person is mindful, they don't fall in love. They don't, that just doesn't arise because their mind is clear and they have a friendliness, they have a, a purity and a peacefulness about them. Again, this gets into, starts to get into where this becomes quite unpleasant because of how deeply ingrained it is in us that we should care, that we should love, even that we should desire that these are a part of life, that these are a part of what it means to be human, all this what just turns out to be real rhetoric and, and really meaningless. If people didn't didn't love, you know, there would be no humans. We wouldn't get married and have kids or we wouldn't have kids and what would happen to humanity if we all became like you? As if that means anything. I mean again the, the stars don't care uh, About things like humans, the, the sun doesn't care that it's nourishing plants and so on. The mind and, and mind states are what they are. The state of being a human is just a construct. It's something that's evolved over time. We know this. We know that humans haven't always lived on the earth. It's something that's evolved not by divine um, providence or, or design. It's just simply something that happened, something that over time evolved. And so our arguments of the rightness of it all are, are, are not nearly as important as the arguments of, of good and bad, right? Beneficial, harmful, useful, useless. Um, and, and I think ultimately perhaps consistent and inconsistent because we... We strive after all, all number of things, you know, we love anything from cheesecake to sex to music to family to helping other people, you know, many, a, a broad perspective of things that we might love. We love other beings, we love them so much we want them to be happy, our children, our parents, our friends. Um, and, and it's all for the purpose of happiness, and yet it doesn't lead to where we think it leads. It doesn't actually lead to happiness. The, the part of us that cares, that is bothered, that is dependent, is not a static state. When you want for someone to be happy, you're cultivating desire. When you want an orange or a cheesecake, or when you want... Uh, to, to see something beautiful, a beautiful person, human, just beautiful work of art even. You're building up a desire, it's a habit in the mind. I mean, scientists can show you that this is how the brain, the brain works. You know, it's not a static state. And so it will never be a stable, peaceful, harmonious um, way to live. It's actually a cause of a great deal of, of suffering in the world, of course. But it's inherently unstable because it's building up an increase of a need for some specific way of being. You know, if, if things are like this, I'll be happy. It's why 
families fight with each other. As I said, when when uh, our friends or our families or our loved ones don't act the way we want. It's, of course, the cause of suffering when we don't get what we want. When we aren't able to make a romantic connection with someone else, they don't love us the way we love them, or they do, and we're, we go at it for a while, and then we break up because of the violence of our emotions, the instability. You know, these things people say about love and hate being, what is it, love and hate are... So there's some saying about how they're almost the same, and it's not really that they're almost the same, it's that they're they're so closely tied to each other. You love the more you love this thing, the more violently you will you will react when you don't get it. So we say, Why is it that I love someone one day and I hate them the next day? Is because you liked the things that they did. You liked the experiences that you had that day. And as soon as something because you developed that liking so much that as soon as something came that wasn't that, as soon as you weren't able to get that, why aren't you the way you were yesterday? Why aren't you? We react much more violently than if it was someone we didn't love or weren't attached to. So it, it's this is all not answering the question, but trying to detail the difference between well, the difference between metta and raga, really. The difference between what we might consider a wholesome form of, not love, but friendliness, and and everything else, all the other kinds of things we call love. And it's so confusing to us and, and um, hard to understand because of its association with ignorance. So just want to drive home that point that we don't love because of any rational or any good reason. We don't cling or care. I mean, many people will actually criticize someone who tries to say, you know, it's not rational to love, as I said, you know, but it's not, it, it's not a bad argument to say, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't criticize love just because it's not rational. Of course, some things are not rational. That's not really the most important thing in Buddhism. But we don't love for any good reason. We don't love thinking that it's actually going to bring us happiness. This is a hard point to understand, because it appears that we love things because they bring us happiness. That appears to be the case. It appears to be um, we have some kind of thought process that, yes, I'm going to get that because it makes me happy. We don't. We don't because we don't have that capacity when we're craving for something. Um, and, and this is easiest to see with a drug addict. A drug addict is rational, is generally rational in their mind to the extent that they are generally aware that this isn't making them happy. And yet the process of engaging in their addiction continues. They're, they're unable to stop it. It, it has nothing to do with uh, any kind of good reason for doing it. It's, it's steeped, this is what it means to be steeped in delusion and ignorance. It doesn't mean we're intellectually ignorant. It means the process of liking something, literally any kind of liking, that process is, is, is in darkness. That moment when you like something, you don't have the clarity of mind to see that what you're liking is good or bad. That's literally how liking, or that, that's, that's actually how liking comes to be. That, that's uh, necessarily a part of the process of liking. And so that's why a person who is mindful, we talk about metta and what it actually means, really isn't love, because it isn't, because it can't be. Because a state of clarity of mind has no love in it. <laughs> And and as uncomfortable as that might sound to some, um, we have to remember that the word love is is a very contrived and and com complicated word, and and really doesn't say much about what's going on underneath because it means we use it in many different contexts. But the point, and the more salient and more accurate point, is that a state of clarity of mind can't cling, can't. 
be bothered. It isn't bothered, of course. It's a strong state. It's a pure and clear and composed state. So getting to the actual answer of how, and so I'm going to modify the question because, of course, it's ultimately, well, love and attachment are still just the same thing, but how can you be friendly? Um, how can you be kind to others? How can you help others? How can you be caring to the extent of not actually caring, but but be perfectly and, and uh, ultimately, completely um, engaged in helping others? You see, because it doesn't stop that; it actually opens that up to a very pure state. Um, how how can you so how can you have that state and not the other one, not the state of of caring and so on? So the, there is the practice of what we call metta. And that's, of course, one way of, of engaging in it. Um, you can develop many different positive states of mind. And so many people, if they have strong anger issues, they might develop this kind of uh, friendliness towards others. But ultimately, hopefully it's become clear that what we're actually talking about is... Um, and where this question is coming from is really from this very large pool of of mind states that are all ultimately caught up in attachment. And for that you really should never practice metta. Metta is not designed as a practice to do that because of course if you have attachment to someone saying may you be happy is not going to stop that attachment. Metta is not designed and it does it's not designed. It it doesn't have the, the capacity to free you from attachment. It, it's, its use and its benefit is to free you from anger. Because if you're constantly saying, may you be, may you suffer, may you be in pain, then, then changing that to say to yourself, may you be happy, it's a very good and useful tool. That's what metta is actually for. So if someone has anger and hatred towards others, it's a very useful tool. But it's not so useful for um, for getting rid of desire. So the way to have just metta, just friendliness, where you actually have a pure mind, is, is just that, to have a pure mind and to free yourself from desire. And the only way to do that, and this is what should really settle a lot of the discomfort surrounding this Buddhist proposition of not caring and not loving and not and so on, is that it's... Um, it's objective investigation. We're not. I'm not proposing these things as a belief you have to have, or even something you have to understand. What we're talking about is perspectives, and we're uh, describing a, a state of perfect clarity, where the mind actually knows what it's doing, and we're making kind of the claim that. When you have that clarity, these kinds of states that we call love and caring and so on, they just can't arise. They just don't arise. Being bothered, being upset, they don't arise in a clear state of mind. They, they, don't, they, aren't, they aren't compatible with it. And so when we cultivate mindfulness, we're actually doing us a, ourselves a great service in terms of being more friendly, in terms of being better and kinder nicer people to each other simply because we're doing away with our um, need for others to make us happy you know, we're doing away with a volatility that can taint any kind of friendliness we might have you're friends with someone but then they act in a certain way that you don't like because you've gotten attached to the way they are you get angry at them, you get upset why? because you needed them to make you happy when they suffer, then you get upset. When people die, you get upset. So all of that is really, it has nothing to do with us being kind or nice to each other or even being happy. It just has to do with our, uh, it's not even a good reason. It's not even a temporary happiness. It's not even something we're looking for, like this will make me temporarily happy. It actually doesn't come from that. It's just blindness. It's a bad habit. 
when you look closely it kind of dissolves you become more content more at peace you don't need others to make you happy you aren't concerned when others suffer you simply help when you can of course because that's the right thing to do it's just the natural pure way to act it's the it's also the way to find happiness of course helping others being kind to each other being kind to each other leads to happiness that's why you do it not because not because sorry not because um, it, it will make you happy when they are happy But because it's the, the way of being You know, when you are kind to others Regardless of the outcome Sorry, that might be confusing Because it sounds like I'm saying You help others because Once you've helped them Them being helped makes you happy That's not the case You helping them makes you happy It, 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 it gives you peace and strength, really It's a very pure state of mind to help someone and when you help someone with a pure mind, it doesn't matter what the result is, because of course that's out of your hands. The reason why many aid workers become burnt out is because they get attached, because they care. And it might sound kind of cold or, or hard-hearted, but they aren't able to help in the end because they get burnt out. They don't actually make as much of a difference as they might if they were detached, as we say. I mean, I don't like to use that word because it sounds so dry and cold and it's not you know, being not attached is being pure and and content it doesn't matter whether my actions bear fruit i do them because they're good and the actions themselves are productive of happiness so um so the real answer which i could have just said at the beginning is be mindful of course a lot of these questions have simple answers, and the simple answers are always try to be more mindful, cultivate mindfulness and clarity, and when you see clearly, you'll let go of all the attachment. But it is important, <clears throat> as I said, things like clinging and craving are associated with things like delusion and ignorance, and so this concept of love is, I think, one that we have to we have to accept or acknowledge is very much associated with delusion, with wrong view, the views relating to you know, how good love is or that there is a good kind of love and caring is good and so on. And that some, somehow you actually benefit or someone benefits from you getting upset when others uh, suffer and that sort of thing. So that's the answer to that question. Thank you for asking. Wish you all the best.